again, uh, thank you so very much for being here. Yes. These guys want to, you know, want to bombard you with a bunch of questions. I would like to from you know how you were able to get all the way to it. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. How's everyone doing? Good. Find me out again today. It changes your whole world, right? Um, well, it's great to be here. I grew up in Colorado, so I went to Smoky Hill High School a long, long time ago. And when, do you go to Smoky Hill? Oh, that's funny. Um, yep, so I was probably a junior or a senior in high school, and my dad and I used to kind of have hangout time on Monday nights, and my mom would go do her thing, go to Bunko or whatever it was that mom did, and um, we would watch Monday night football, and we just had a bunch of fun. I always loved sports. My dad was a longtime high school baseball coach at Smoky Hill, and so I remember sitting there, and one night Melissa Stark comes on. She's a sideline reporter at the time. She still works for NFL Network now. Um, and she came on and it just clicked. I was like, dad, like, that's what I want to do. That's super cool. Like I like sports. That looks like a fun job. Both of us being very naive, you know, my dad looks at me he's like, great. I think it's a great idea. Not knowing how competitive, obviously, uh, the field would be. So that was kind of just my first initial look of someone, my dad specifically just encouraging me and saying like, do it, go for it. And from that moment on, I really spent a lot of time researching like what it would take and started to realize how tough the field was, how competitive it was. Um, I chose to go to Colorado State University, uh, got a great internship with the radio station there, ended up doing um, a lot of radio for Colorado State football broadcasts and um, created like a prep report segment that I did and aired in Fort Collins and worked at the local campus television station. So that was really my first time being on air, getting to learn, make mistakes. Um, right out of school, I got a national television job. It was a crazy story that I was playing the cross in college. We made it to the finals. Um, the people broadcasting, it was a company called CSTV, College Sports Television, ended up becoming what CBS Sports is now. And they gave me a role of like a student sideline reporter and we got to do some cool features on our team. And then if we didn't make it to the finals, they let me do the sideline reporting for the men's and women's championship games. Little did I know it was kind of a tryout as they were launching this network and they had just gotten a division one football package for the next fall. So I ended up going to New York, I'm interviewing, I get this job, I'm moving to California. I'm so excited, it's amazing. Like I made it, I'm a national sideline reporter. And one game in, <laughs> they decided to cut all their budget because they way overshot the moon. So um, basically, I lost my job like within two weeks. And it was really disappointing. And it really got me back to the drawing board and realizing, like, wow, that just doesn't happen. Like, I need a lot of work. I need to go be on air somewhere. So I end up in Flint, Michigan. Does anyone know where Flint, Michigan is? Yeah, you probably know Flint because of what? Water, yes, that's what they've become known for, unfortunately. Um, Flint is a rough little town in Michigan. It used to be thriving at one point with the auto industry. And then it kind of, over time, has become, you know, a really rundown town. But it's a hotbed for sports. So it, it was a great place to be. Covered a lot of high school sports, Michigan, Michigan State. Um, covered the Pistons frequently. And it was really just more than anything, my opportunity to get on air every day and to get on air and make mistakes and grow and learn and realize it's what I really want to be doing and at the same time I was 23 years old I just moved from California out to Flint Michigan it was miserable I hated it it was really a gut check of like is this what I want to be doing and on a whim I had an opportunity to coach lacrosse back in um, California at UCLA and I was like oh I'm gonna take that hopefully some TV stuff will show up um, and throughout that whole process, it, it was a great job. It was good to get back to California, but it really made me realize what I really want to do and that it was going to take everything to do what I wanted to do. So there was a point in my life um, in 2005 that I was coaching lacrosse. I was working at Starbucks. I was my brother's assistant for his startup company running errands to the grocery store. And then I'd randomly go work for ESPN and do like a cheerleading championship or something. It was a very dynamic life of getting to see both ends of the spectrum and it just made me keep wanting to work harder and make sure that TV was still kind of my career focus and my career path. 
Um, I had a great intersection in 2007. Um, I ended up hiring an, ag an agent because I knew I wanted to get back into TV full time. And in 2007, I got the opportunity to go down to San Diego and interview for the San Diego Padres job. Um, I didn't really know much about the job. I didn't know much about regional sports television then because it was still pretty new in terms of covering baseball. Um, but getting down there, talking to the executive producer, um, just talking baseball really, he was really excited about my baseball knowledge growing up in a baseball family. Um, and it was such a neat fit. I had amazing coworkers help me grow and help me, you know, really learn about sideline reporting and learn about TV. And I stayed in San Diego for five years. I ended up growing into the role of hosting our pre and post game show for the Padres. And then in 2000, 11, we lost the contract to the Padres. So it was really my first, um, well, my second since I got laid off my second week on my first job. Um, it was my second time really experiencing kind of the brutal part of this industry that it's it's a business, it's a money business, and you know people work on contracts and not just the talent working on contracts, but actual networks working on contracts. And our network lost the rights to the Padres. They had been the home of the Padres for 20 plus years. Um, it was a very sad day. They laid all of us off. And it was this really hard time of like, gosh, I really have to find a new job. I've been loving baseball, but I might have to go back and work in other sports. Um, the Anaheim Ducks reached out and I did their pre and post game show for that fall and winter, which was really cool. I'd never really done hockey, so it was a big learning curve and a good experience. Um, and then simultaneously, Alana Rizzo, who was here for a long time with the Rockies, ended up taking a job. And I never thought I'd have the opportunity to come home to Colorado. There was just a lot of great talent on air here. There was a lot of great female talent. Um, and because of a great relationship I had had with their executive producer, you know, he called and we got the chance to connect and um, it was the perfect timing, perfect opportunity. And so I got hired in 2012 to come back. So I just finished my seventh season um, covering the Colorado Rockies as our pre and post game host. Um, and as mentioned, very kind, I got the chance to call a major league baseball game this year. I actually called five of them, including spring training. Um, I'm gonna be calling my first college basketball game on Saturday in New Mexico. Um, so really great year for me, a lot of big challenges, things, again, that I never dreamed of. I never thought about doing play-by-play. -play. It was just kind of an opportunity um, that some producers brought, brought up to me, and, and even my coworkers were really encouraging of it. So it was, uh, it was a cool experience this year. I did it, actually it's a really funny story, I did it last week in the middle of a college basketball game. Like I need my pin when I go catch up with the coach to write notes and it was like towards getting towards the end of the half and I'm about to interview this coach and I dropped my pin in the back of the basket so it like went under the basket. So there was no pin to be had for my other like write down what the coach is saying. So anyways, it happens to, to everyone. Um, <laughs> Don't even worry about it. Don't even worry about it. So that's kind of a long-winded path. I mean, that's how I got to be um, the Rocky sideline reporter and then eventually move into to the hosting role. And so it's awesome to be home. It's fun to be here. And um, I can't believe I'm embarking on my 13th season covering Major League Baseball. So um, it's been, it's been a, a lot of fun with a lot of challenges. But I just want to open up to questions because I want to make sure I'm tailoring my talk towards whatever you guys are interested in. So... What is your favorite aspect of calling, I mean, of what the different positions yeah. are broadcasting in a baseball game? Yeah. Calling it. Yep. That's a great question. I think, I think the biggest thing is, like, again, um, what I really learned out of it is how important representation is in our field. And it made me think so much back on watching Melissa Stark for the first time. And I said, I want to be a football sideline reporter because that's the first woman I really saw and engaged doing that job. Um, so I realized the importance of maybe I never decided I wanted to do play by play because I never saw a woman doing that, you know, someone that looked like me. So um, from that perspective, I realized the importance of representation, but I also realized just it takes such a different part of your brain to do all the jobs. You know, when, when I'm doing sideline reporting, I do a lot of preparation um, for very little time. I mean, you're really, you know, I tell everyone, like 10% of what you see of us being on camera is my day. The other 90% is a lot of conversations with people. It's a lot of prep work. It's a lot of sitting in the truck with producers. It's a lot of editing. It's, you know, just a lot of the grunt work stuff. But 
I think I enjoy the process. I enjoy all that. I enjoy um, the people I get to meet, the people we work with, um, you know, getting to look at a game, looking at the college basketball game this weekend. You're looking at these teams and their stories and the big pictures and like that's what we love to do, right? We love to tell stories and how do you make those come alive to the audience? So I think, you know, roundabout way, the common denominator of what I love doing is being able to to open up the game, to, to set the stage for the game, um, and then to kind of wrap the game up, which is kind of what I get to do hosting pre and post. I get to do a little bit more storytelling when I'm sideline reporting, and then obviously when you're doing play-by-play, -play, um, your main job is to guide the game, but there's a lot of storytelling time, especially in baseball, um, way more than any other sport. So, you know, they, they are. They're, they're three very different jobs, but I love how they all connect together, and I love getting to watch other people, when I'm in the sideline role, I love getting to watch Drew Goodman do play-by-play because -play he's so good at it and you can learn so much from it. Um, I think we have a really cool team of people that make a broadcast complete and that's not just this person's show or this person's show. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It's really hard. I think, um, you know, just like anything, it takes a lot of experience and a lot of practice and where are you going to get that practice from, you know? Um, I'm having to practice what I preach. I usually tell people that say they want to do it to mute their TV at home and you know call some action uh, as you would or record yourself and then go back and listen to it or have someone else listen to it. Um, so that's kind of how I've found myself preparing. I mean really the baseball part we had talked a lot about it. We were kind of preparing for it might, hap might be happening, and then it really got sprung on me the day before. So I didn't have a lot of time to prep, which may have been a good thing, so I wasn't driving myself crazy. But um, a story that kind of got leaked out of it is I, uh, my husband, I got home that night, and uh, he put on MLB The Show, the video game. And he's like, all right, Padres, you know, Rockies, go. Like, you're going to call this game. Mm -hmm. And I needed to come up with a home run call and all those kinds of things. So that kind of all manifests itself there. But um, same thing, like for basketball this weekend, you know, I played basketball growing up. I've watched a lot of basketball. I've done a lot of sidelines hosting for basketball. But it's more about like the rhythm and the timing and identifying players. So I've been like looking at a lot of tape this week. And um, I made, I don't think I have with me, I made these like boards they call them where you have like kind of every player out so that you can spot easy down the court but I'm learning like even in just watching film and not like the real game it's fast and if you're like oh shoot who's that guy again you look down the ball's on the other end other things are happening so you really have to be be on your game it's a lot just more about like recognition and um you know guiding guiding the audience through what's happening and that's the difference between radio play-by-play -play and television play-by-play -play, right like radio, you really have to paint the picture. Like every detail, you have to be on it. I mean, wow, I can't even imagine doing, like I think hockey radio play-by-play -play would be the most intense. Um, but, but TV, people have eyes, they're watching the game with you. You don't have to be as detailed, you know, pass to pass or whatever. There's a little bit more development for some, for some talking in between passes or storylines or whatever, but you can't miss the big moment. And I think that's the hardest part is you know when you're reporting or hosting there's a lot of things you can prep for um but that's like true live tv right you can't script a game like once the ball's in the air whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen so i'd say that's the biggest challenge yeah i mean i think you guys are just in such a cool time and i hope you recognize that i mean not just in sports broadcasting business but obviously what's been happening politically and you know there's there's a lot more gender equality conversations um in the workplace and then um obviously just about respect too for for women in, in businesses so i hope that you all can recognize that time I, I don't think i took the time to recognize it when I was in college, and I think we had it pretty good. You know, there's a lot of women that paved the way way before I ever got into television, and I'm so grateful for that. I mean, I can't imagine a time where I'd be denied access to get into a locker room to cover the same story as my male counterparts. And that happened all the way, like, close to the 80s, you know? It's not that far ago. And even early in my career, I definitely, there's, there's some sexism, of course, still out there, but I feel like at the end of the day, whether you're a male or a female, the biggest thing is you have to be confident in who you are and what you bring to the table, right? And that's your knowledge 
um, and that's your personality because you're the only you, you know, you have to be confident in that. And I think the other thing too is you just have to respect people and treat people great. And if everyone did that in our business, it would run very smooth. But there are there's some there's some old school thought process that um, you know it, it's a it's a man's club for sure. And I think even now that I'm entering a different level of trying to do play by play. I've been blown away by the reception I've got from a lot of very long time play by play men, because that's what most, most of them are, who have been very gracious in you know, calling me, congratulating me, welcoming me into the club, asking me if there's anything they can do for me. Um, you know, you can also feel there's some that are like, oh, that's nice, you know, <laughs> move along. And that's okay. That's fine. It's not their cup of tea. I understand that. Um, but I think it all circles back to that representation part. The more we're in positions um, of people working hard and getting there, the less likely it's going to be to be a unique situation for the next generation, you know. And that's my hope in the process. Um, I'm, I'm definitely not in a comfortable place to be like, oh, I, I'm so good at this. I'm not. Oh, my gosh, I have to work at it so hard. And there's no place for me to practice doing play by play right now. It's just doing it live on our air. So um, there's parts of me that wish I could go back and do minor league baseball at the age of 22 when I didn't have to provide for my family at home and just to kind of enjoy that opportunity and get to know it. Um, you know, it was cool this year. There were a couple of girls, a couple of females that were calling play by play at the minor league level. And I think next year there'll probably be even more. And I hope in 10 years um, there's even greater representation there that they're practicing their craft and getting better and being able um, to get to the next level. So I think, you know, the gender stereotypes have definitely subsided a lot since I've gotten in this business. I think the other big challenge being a female, especially when you cover um, men's athletics, is just that, you know, how you handle yourself. Perception's reality, and unfortunately, um, there have been a lot of rumors in our business. Um, I'll just take the baseball side specifically of you know certain sideline reporters who, um, you know, people say they're sleeping with this player, they're doing that, and that's just unfortunate when it's not the case. But again, it's about you know handling yourself professionally and making sure um, you're in the right place at the right time. We travel with the team, and so there's a lot of like just very very not strange things but things that I've made sure in my life that I've said okay like I'm you know you just don't ever want to be in a situation that could look bad you know so we travel in our group that we travel with there's a lot of people on the plane from TV so I was just kind of hang out with our TV crew um, you know the guys on the team are great very professional the older I've got the less like strange it's gotten because they're all way younger than me now um, but starting out there was a lot of like I just wanted to always make sure I was dressing professionally I was you know showing up to the job professionally um, to knock a off a lot of those stereotypes that come along with being a woman in uh, a man's I guess field nope yep so that's actually a great question so uh, yeah when I got hired it was Root Sports we um, were owned by DirecTV owned and operated by DirecTV and DirecTV got bought by AT&T so I'm sure if any of you have DirecTV at home you've noticed that the AT&T Globe is now a part of that um, so that merger from a wide business standpoint was hundreds of thousands of employees you know it's not just our teeny little tiny TV station to them so um, it, it took a long time. It took like 18 months for like the branding part to surface. So it is interesting because even though we're this production company television entity, we're still owned by a big business. So there's a lot of complications in that merger. So eventually we had a brand change. We went to AT&T Sportsnet. Um, and I'm sure you've seen in the news that AT&T bought Time Warner. Um, so there's like another merger. So it definitely lends like, oh, what does this mean? You know, and a lot of questions. And although we don't ultimately know the future, I think it's a good thing because, um, you know, Time Warner is a production house. They have a lot of different companies, including HBO and TNT, and they have a lot of live sporting events. Um, but yeah, I, I think when you work at a company, um, even before Root Sports, when they were Fox Sports West or Fox Sports Rocky Mountain, um, Fox Sports sold off the Fox Sports Rocky Mountain, Fox Sports Pittsburgh, and Seattle to a company called Liberty Media. Media. And it's because um, they wanted to flip them and make money on them. So at that point in time, a lot of people, a lot of people I work with now, did get laid off on the production side. They got hired back as freelancers, some of them. And then it took a long time for them to get their full-time jobs back. So 
Um, yeah, it's interesting. There, there is an interesting model to it. I think the beauty about sports television is it's really, um, it's the last live drama. So when you think about what makes money in the world of television production, um, I think sports will always have a place because it's appointment TV, right? You don't want to DVR the game only to have every single um, app on your phone update you the score and then you're like, well, what was the point of that? So um, yeah, I, I think from that regards, you know, that there's a landscape that's very valuable to sports television. Is there a amount of jobs in the production side of things? Because that's what I'm more interested in. Is obviously yeah. Operations. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, I still think there is some competitiveness to it. But when you talk, I wish I had the specific numbers, but when you talk about a Rockies broadcast, um, we probably have um, 50 to 60 people working on that game specifically. So in the truck, you would of course have, you know, your front bench, which would be your producer, director, technical director. Um, you'd have your Chiron operator, your tape guy. There's definitely some people that have full, full-time jobs or full-time packages as they, they're called for freelancers. Um, but then we have a crew of like 25 more people that are, you know, pulling cables, running cameras. Um, gosh, you name it, doing a million things. So yeah, there's a ton of work and a ton of opportunity. Um, I would say the competitive part of it is there's a lot of people on a list. So usually in cities, especially a big city like Denver, there's a crewer and there's a lot of these freelance people on the list and then the crewer will go and let's say like a busy time of the year, um, let's say Nuggets are in the playoffs, uh, Avs are in the playoffs, Rockies are at home. So like all these people are getting pulled by the crewer to go like do national TV for playoffs, come do their normal package at Rockies. Um, there might be you know something else in town, whatever. So there's enough jobs to go around when you're in a big city. I think it would be a lot harder to live in the past in like Las Vegas whenever we'd travel there for work. Um, it was really difficult to get a good crew to do like college basketball. We'd end up traveling a lot of people because to hire out a crew there, they just at the time didn't have any professional sports, primarily had boxing. But like in a big city with seven professional sports teams and a lot of college events and other events coming in out of town, um, there's definitely a lot of opportunity if that helps. Yep. There's like 10 of us, stats guy, that all travel like in the traveling party. And then they would hire out, let's say there's 12 camera positions. They're hiring out all 12 of those. They're hiring out audio one, audio two for the field, audio in the booth, um, and several other positions in Los Angeles. And that's where it gets complicated and weird and interesting is because every state runs differently. So California is a union state. So anytime we go there, the guy that runs our operations, this guy Mike Shano, he's in charge of like looking at the budget and going, okay, well, you know, we go to California X amount of times a year, we're gonna have to hire a union crew there. It's just a different set of rules. Um, as talent, like I can't ask the audio guy to like flip the light on because he can't do that because it's not part of the union. <laughs> There's just like a lot of weird uh, technical things that go on. And then I guess you make your money up on the other side and I'm kind of just making all this up. I mean, this is what I think happens. <laughs> but I think you make your money up on the other side, like our regional at t Sports Net, we're also in Houston and Pittsburgh and Seattle. So when we go there, there's sometimes some crew sharing that we can do. Sometimes in, in big feeds like baseball, not every away place we go, but some places are dual feeds, meaning like they both operate separately, but we share cameras. Um, so that cuts down on some costs here and there. So it's just kind of dependent on where you go. And one last question. Yeah. Why is there still games that you guys don't have the rights to broadcast? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, I, you know, it's really a, a product of the contract that they originally did. So we're obligated and contracted to broadcast 150 games with six spring training games. So um, the contract will come up in two years. And obviously the way the life is moving, everyone wants to watch every single game and right. it'll get there eventually, but yeah. We missed like Nolan's three home run game. Like, Trust me, they do it on purpose. I think the players are like, we're not on TV today, so I'm gonna have a game of a lifetime. <laughs> How do you come up with your home run? Oh yeah. Um, so the day I found out I was calling the game um, was a Sunday. And we were sitting in the press box. Uh, Charlie Blackman hit a home run. You know, the fountains come up in center field. And I said something, oops, I said something on Twitter um, in regards to the fountains. And it wasn't fire up the fountains originally. And Corey Sullivan, our analyst, um, 
we were walking out to the post game set and he's like, so have you come up with your home run call for tomorrow? You know, I need to hear it because I don't want you to embarrass yourself. Um, so I told him whatever I was thinking and he was like, oh, yeah, that's pretty good. And we started kind of spitballing and then I say fire up all the time. Like, oh, let's go, let's fire it up. So he was like, what, what about fire up the fountains? Um, so I was like, yeah, so it worked. And then when I was calling my husband's video game, it came out. <laughs> so yeah, it worked out good. Yeah. Um, with your first job going to your second and to where you are now, um, how were those transitions in, of course, you know, going to a different, I guess, to a different job or to a different location, state, how did you deal with those transitions? And um, I guess, or if not, what made it more, how did you get to a place where you could adapt to where you were working to be comfortable and successful? Yeah. Um, you know, it's hard. I think change is hard for any person. I love to travel. I, I love to meet different people. But um, when you're moving and you're not living by any family or any friends for that first time, like it was a huge adjustment for me, for sure. Um, what I think I started to realize going place to place is a lot of newsrooms, especially in local TV, a lot of regional sports networks, like they're almost like the same people in a different location, you know, and, and it makes it a really comfortable feeling. Like I find comfort in the chaos because TV is really chaotic sometimes and the people there um, are just fun and different and like you, I started to notice a pattern of like in the next place, it's like, oh, that guy reminds me of that guy back in Flint or whatever. So. Uh, you just found comfort in, in the people that were around you. And then um, it's funny because I had this conversation uh, with, with a girl yesterday who was just transitioning to a new job. And she's like, you know, I just made it through this really long baseball season. And now I got a new job. And, like, I've moved. And I'm in a new basketball season. And we're traveling. And I've never met any – I haven't met anyone yet. And, like, ah, it's just crazy, you know. So I, I think that's, that's definitely a warning going into it. I tell people if you enjoy your nights and weekends, like, don't get into sports TV. You just will not have them. That's not a product. But you will get a random Monday off sometimes, which you can get a lot of errands done on a Monday. Um, and yeah, again, I think you just, you kind of have to have an adventurous spirit, you know, be ready if, you, if you're willing to. Um, I would say too, for people that want to be on air, you have to be willing to move. I mean, I talked to a lot of people that are just like, well, I'm never leaving Colorado. Look, this is where I'm from. And I'm like, well, okay, like that might work for you, but there's hundreds of other people who don't want to leave Colorado and want this job. And you have to have experience to have this job. And where are you going to get that? You got to go somewhere that you can find that, you know? Um, so my advice to the same young lady I was talking to yesterday is just remember it's not forever. And that's something I wish I could tell myself in Flint. I think I would have enjoyed it a lot more if I would have known it was only going to be a short year um, or two years or whatever it is. Because in the grand scheme of things, you can learn so much about um, yourself and you can even find things to enjoy in a bad situation if you know it's not forever you know right yeah we we do about 30 college basketball games and I'm, I'm definitely not on every one of them so um, like our preseason once we get into conference play we'll be doing two games a week but right now it's kind of hit and miss you know we have a game and then seven days off and I mean there's a lot of prep work in between for basketball but it's it's uh, yeah not as strenuous as just like the day today today <laughs> Of baseball, so uh, yeah. You guys, well, uh, Jenny, thank you. So oh my gosh, thank you for having me. I appreciate I it. I will ask you for ten additional minutes because sometimes they want. To yes. One -on -one conversation. Of course, happy to do thank that. So yes, much. thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. So you guys know the routine. <laughs>